although there may be some names in it you recognize. Westport would become the crucible of our childhood, the place that would form and sustain us. During this time, my conscious life began. That is to say, my memory kicks in. And so I can say with assurance that I loved it, everything about it. The Connecticut woods were my Eden. Without realizing it, my family was anticipating the great post-war migration to the suburbs, where the American dream would search for itself in split-level houses and country clubs and wood-paneled station wagons. But in the late 1940s and early 1950s, Westport was not yet a bedroom community. It was a self-sustaining village with lots of forests and meadows, closer in spirit to New England than to the New York metropolis. There were onion farms in the back country, unheated bungalows along the shore, and a few red brick factories along the Saugatuck River. Shopping centers had not yet sprouted on the Boston Post Road, not even supermarkets. Local grocery stores delivered to customers' houses, and their delivery men tried to get through even when blizzards dropped two feet of snow. People didn't lock their doors, and some left their car keys in the ignition. Many artists and writers lived here. So did theater people because of the summer productions in the 100-year-old Red Barn of the Westport Country Playhouse. Main Street and the side streets were replete with shops that fascinated children. An Army-Navy store, Western Auto, Klein's Toys, a hardware store with wooden floors, a five and dime with open bins, and, most of all, Bill's Smoke Shop, a tiny cabin that dispensed penny candies like jawbreakers and wax lips. The Fine Arts Movie Theater showed double features for 25 cents. <laughs> that was the Westport Puck that I remember very well. Um, so I've been asked to say 